I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Coming up. We've had Lee Nielsen come down every year around this time and do something. This is the first time it's been this big. Highland Woodworking hosts a huge hand tool event. We'll show you how they handled it. It's like kid in a candy store, the whole thing. It's just very <laughs> impressive. Then we're teaming up with chairmaker Jeff Miller. See what machine he uses to shave off time when building his beautiful chairs. After that, we're headed to Matthew Teague's workshop for a technique that will keep your chisel from losing its edge. I imagined myself being a contemporary furniture maker. Then our Moment with a Master series takes us to Woodbury, Tennessee. Meet Alf Sharp, a master furniture maker. So talented, he was invited to make period reproductions for a president's home. It quickly became apparent that if I was gonna make a living as a woodworker, I was gonna have to make traditional furniture. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodwork. I'm at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. Woodworkers from all over the world come here to get their hands on the best tools and learn from some of the biggest names in the industry. Recently, Highland Woodworking hosted the Lee Nielsen Hand Tool event. If you weren't here, this is what you missed. of Highland Woodworking's Lee Nielsen Hand Tool event? Well, I, I can tell you that I've been to several. I've been to them in Chicago. I've been to them in Indianapolis. And, and I'd say this is the best attended one that I've been to. And, uh, and you have some very good uh, instructors here. And I should know because I've been doing this for over 40 years. It's great. I mean, first of all, you, you, you come down here with, with, with Highland Woodwork and it's just a beautiful place here. You know, it's nice to come in and, and walk around and, uh, you know, anytime you can get the Lee Nelson where you can get these, these planes and, and actually get to test some stuff out and, and try some of the planes, it, it's fun. It's, it's like kid in a candy store, the whole thing. It's just very <laughs> impressive. The normal position to rasp is exactly the same than when you bring a plane. You bring a plane like this and you push for a while. Right. Of course, along the grain. Yes. A rasp is exactly the same move, but across the grain. So it means you start there, you push that way. So it's the same skewed push that you would use with a plane, but exactly it's exactly the same. Exactly the same. <laughs> We've had Lee Nielsen come down every year around this time and do something. This is the first time it's been this big, I think. But uh, we do it in order to get uh, people feeling excited about hand tool woodworking. Uh, we've got a, a big woodworking community. A lot of them don't know how to sharpen a plane and therefore don't have much happiness trying to use a plane. That's right. So I think that's uh, really key is uh, that these Lee Nielsen guys and Chris Schwartz are teaching people how to sharpen a plane blade or a chisel and then they get to put that in the plane finest planes made the Lee Nielsen planes and make some shavings in this hardwood and uh, feel the satisfaction that you get with that curl shaving curling out of a piece of pretty piece of hardwood <laughs> My name is Phil Colson. I've been working at Highland Woodworking for 28 years. Wow! Tell us about this event from your perspective as someone who works here. This is one of the most exciting ones that we've had. And I, like I said, I've been here a long time. Uh, the enthusiasm that we're getting here. Uh, the incredible demonstration of these wonderful Lee Nielsen tools. It's amazing. It's so great that we can bring together quality people experiencing a whole shop full of uh, 
knowledge from hand-cut French rasp to uh, all the chaps at Lee Nielsen. What we're doing on this hard, highly figured wood, we're using the uh, 62 low angle jack. This plain iron is bedded at 12 degrees, but I sharpen the blade at 50 degrees. So it's giving us a cutting angle of 62 degrees. So it's quite high. Right. And what we're doing is we are just taking uh, small shavings here. We're methodically working back and forth across the board. trying to take an even amount of uh, wood from the board. And you can feel that, and it feels quite smooth. It wouldn't get, you wouldn't get that kind of results if you fed that through a power planer because of the, that aggressive figure. Right. It would most likely tear out and leave a lot of follow-up work. Great event. Um, you know, having Lee Nielsen here is pretty amazing. I always enjoy that. Uh, Chris, you know, Chris Schwartz. Um, I really enjoy, you know, listening to him speak. Um, if you can't learn from that guy, then you probably can't learn. This is uh, a Dutch chest, uh, which is very simple to make. Only takes about a couple days of uh, work in the shop, and uh, carries, you know, the complete complement of uh, work, uh, uh, work tools, uh, hand tools that you need. And uh, the other cool thing about it is that it. Uh, it locks up nice at night. So if you don't want people stealing your stuff. Sure. The front lid goes in. This slides in like that. And then that comes down. And the lid secures the slide so that nothing can come out um, at night. So everything locks up. And it only weighs about 97 pounds. So one person can move it around pretty easily. That's great. And you have everything, uh, everything right at hand. This is a European style uh, bench that I, that I encountered. Um, well, I, I, I first saw one on the internet. This is a twin screw vise, and you can take these out and move them into any of these positions. So you have like 19 inches that you can dovetail in, you know, all the way down to the floor. That's so great. You, so you can dovetail a case side in this opening, and uh, then you have this uh, you know, wagon vise that moves in and out. On, on this and a set of dogs so you have up to 24 inches between uh, the dogs for planing and a work and a work surface that allows you to work on that and you can pinch uh, for mortise and tenon work you pinch sure uh, the tenon between there and so this is only you no know, it, it's almost no joinery it's mostly just screws right and um, and then there's one pinned uh, joint here at the corners um, so there, there's a lot of utility there now your big planes here. Oh, these are uh, made by Scott Meek. Uh, he's here somewhere. I've been making wood body planes for a little over three years. And uh, from the beginning, when I made my first uh, jack plane, yeah. I wanted to make a longer plane. And finally, this last year, I, it came to fruition. And I made, made a Sapili joint, because that's what I had. It's a long right. piece of Sapili. And uh, you know, made a 36-inch one, and then realized for my use, it, it was just a little long. Yeah. Some people might want it. But I ended up making the uh, the 28 inch, and I, it just works so well. And this piece here is actually a piece of reclaimed uh, barn wood, sure. white oak. So it's old growth, it doesn't move. Uh, and then got African blackwood for the cross pin and sole and wedge, uh, right. uh, mount sole insert. And, but it's, uh, it's about eight pounds, I think, a little over eight. So it's got good heft, and it just blows through it. With Highland Hardware, there's a woodworking community that fosters the joy of woodworking and a passion for excellence. Mortises and tenons. You find them in every fine woodworking project. The JDS multi router can help you make both. We caught up with Jeff Miller, master furniture maker, and he showed us how he uses one. Chair making calls for a lot, or the kind I do, calls for a lot of compound angle joints like this. And this machine really makes it all very easy. Let me show you. Okay.
that's really all it takes to get a perfect joint. And that would take a lot of time with hand tools. Uh, yeah, yeah, it probably would. Yeah. Especially for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. There's still a lot more show ahead. Matthew Teague provides an easy technique to get the most out of any chisel. Then meet the master whose period detailed designs can be seen in a state capitol and even President Andrew Jackson's home. Don't go away, you're watching The Highland Woodworker. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Order a Saw Stop professional cabinet saw from Highland Woodworking in March or April of 2013 and choose either one of these two accessories for free. That's a $199 extra value. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws like their new powerful 10, 350, 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II, presents the PVW blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip-outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand-cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. Chisels are a staple in most workshops, but they can all lose their edge. Let's head to Matthew Teague's workshop for Popular Woodworking's tips, tricks, and techniques. Matthew, woodworkers are always asking me, when do you know that you need to sharpen? I'll break it into two different categories, basically. First step is grinding, and that's getting a consistent angle on something, and the second is honing, where you're actually putting the cutting edge on it. Once you get it sharp, you'll be cutting with it. When you start to feel any more resistance, that's when you want to hone. If you make it really a quick way to do it, you'll go back to it often. There are a ton of different systems out there for sharpening, and each system seems to have devotees that are very dedicated to the way that they do it. There's a uh, lot to choose from. There is yeah. a ton to choose okay. from. The good news is that I've used I think just about all of these systems at least a few times and I've never found one that didn't work. One of the most important things about sharpening is to find a system that's really quick to set up. This just got an aluminum plate, butts up against a bench stop on the end of my bench and then I just clamped a piece of scrap here that'll hold it in pretty solid here. And after that I've got wet dry sandpaper and I've just used a spray adhesive 
and attached it to the aluminum. And I've got 320, 800, and 1500. Uh, oftentimes I'll go up to 2000 grit. You don't need to flatten the entire back. You really only need that very cutting edge. But down here, it's a little hard to keep it from, from rocking on you. So I'll put just enough there. I've got my right hand on these two side bevels. And then I'm just going to put a, another finger here with the opposite hand. This hand is really doing all the work of pulling it back and forth. And I don't know if you can tell, but I'm actually moving my whole body and not just my hands. You don't want to do that. It'll wear your arm out. You really just it's small motions back and forth. So as you can see, you're starting to see some new marks here. And this looks like 800. We've gone to 800, a little finer. Exactly the same steps. We'll do this all the way through 800. And see, that's cleaning up a lot faster, moving from one grit to the next now. So we'll move to the 1500 now. You can also go to a finer grit. This is a 2000 grit. Nice thing about this system, I keep these grits on here pretty much all the time, but then if I want to go to a 2000, because it's laying down on sandpaper and it's flat, I just set the sheet of paper down. and work that edge. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're starting to get there. Primary bevel, well this is where a lot of people will switch over and use a honing guide. Mm -hmm. I really don't have anything against honing guides at all. The only reason I have kind of stopped using them for this stage is because they take more time. The mistake a lot of people make is they try to do it like this and they're pushing back and forth and what happens is you wind up doing this. It's a lot easier, roll that up on the side and push it back and forth this way. That way the angles of the chisel is always consistent. Just like flattening the back, go straight to 800. Again, the method's the same. Give it a lift and let your whole body kind of work to move that back and forth. Keep the pressure down on the very tip so you're just riding that bevel back and forth looking good. So we'll move up to 1500 now. It's a nice polished edge already. Kind of a mirror finish. Yeah, it looks gonna go nice. To, gonna go to 2000 grit again for that last little bit of honing. And this is just gonna really polish it out. It does. It takes that burr off the back, and then I'll just work back and forth a few times. And then, so you're just coming to a really fine point there. And then and, how are you going to test it? Well, there are a number of different ways to test the sharpness of something. You can take a piece of glossy paper, and a sharp blade will just slice through it. A lot of people will take the end grain of, say, a piece of pine and pair down along it, it should be able to cut a pretty thin shaving on end grain. I kind of do what my grandfather always did, which is just kind of test the sharpness by trying to shave a part of my arm. Oh, that reminds me of the way I, I test mine. I just try it on my mother-in-law's beard. Oh, I, sounds like the Thanksgiving at your house would be pretty interesting. <laughs> it is. There's still a lot more show ahead. Spend a moment with master period furniture maker, Al Sharp. He's coming up next. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. <laughs> 
So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Bessie, a leader in clamps since 1936. If you know clamps, you know Bessie. Bessie, simply better. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. So many master woodworkers receive their initial inspiration from books and pictures. Let's spend a moment with a master, Al Sharp, and find out the source of his inspiration. My parents had a, had a book in their library of uh, 18th century English furniture, just a collection, a picture book. And there was this secretary in there. There was a two-page spread. Uh, it's like the centerfold. <laughs> and the, <laughs> this is furniture. The idea of a secretary and a two-page spread, I've tried to stay away from that. It gets me in trouble every time. <laughs> Sorry that the camera's on. <laughs> well, that's good. Use it if you want to. Furniture porn. <laughs> Alf Sharp is one of the world's most sought after 18th century furniture makers. From his talked about tables, beautiful beds, designer desks, clocks, chairs, and even complicated cabinets, period furniture maker could be Alf's middle name. But interestingly, though, uh, it, I started out, I thought I would, I, I imagined myself being a contemporary furniture maker. I liked contemporary design. Uh, and I liked what they were, the sculptural work that people were doing with exotic woods. But it, it quickly became apparent in Middle Tennessee uh, in the 70s that if I was going to make a living as a woodworker, I was going to have to make traditional furniture. <laughs> there, there, was not a, there was hardly a market at all for contemporary furniture at the time. Becoming any type of furniture maker was not part of the plan for young Alfred. He was on a different track. Like his father, he had sights on a much different career at Vanderbilt University Law School. Woke up in a cold sweat one morning and realized that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. To make ends meet, Alf joined a carpentry crew. All that activity just clicked with me instantly. Just I understood every instruction they gave me. Uh, my, I could make my hands do what my eyes wanted them to do. Uh, the tools felt good in my hands. I, I understood the wood grain. I just, and so uh, uh, I started, I fairly quickly ended up doing interior trim and the kitchen cabinets and the like. And that, at that point, caused me to look at furniture in a completely different light too, you know whoa, that's made out of wood, how'd they do that? Alf was hooked, however, he needed help. I was fortunate to have a couple of mentors who uh, uh, sort of took me under their wing, not so much as work, uh, woodworkers, they didn't know much about the woodworking part, but they knew a great deal about the styles of the uh, 17th through the 19th century. Even though at first I imagined myself as a contemporary furniture maker, I, I quickly uh, f fell in love with, with the 18th century. I think it was one of the real pinnacles of furniture design. After years of hard work, Alf really got into a groove. They were getting ready to do a very comprehensive restoration of the Tennessee State Capitol building, which is quite a significant piece of architecture. They asked me to do a couple of simple things at first to the Speaker of the Senate's podium and and that kind of thing, just, just adding a few little details, taking them back in time a little bit. Um, 
and they liked what I did. And so that, that ended up being more and more work. Uh, and in the, in the process of doing that, I hooked up with the uh, architect of the restoration of the Hermitage, which is Andrew Jackson's home here in Nashville. Uh, he was he was involved in both in both things, and um, he said he said we're getting ready to do a similar restoration on the Hermitage. You, you need to come look. I said you bet. So they asked me to make a mantelpiece. They had they had an original an original architect's drawing of the original mantelpiece. They said now we want this done entirely in the period manner. No power tools, wanted all hand tools, start to finish. I said, well, can I use my electric lights? <laughs> they, they, they allowed that. But you know, even that would make a difference. I mean, the lighting levels in an old fashioned shop would be different. Tool, tool marks would be less apparent. Alf's historic hermitage commission also included carved Venetian blinds, faux grained exterior doors, Jackson presses, and a replica of President George Washington's swiveling mahogany office chair. His fame was gaining momentum, and with it came an invitation to speak at the Furniture Society's annual conference. They called me up just because I was local, and they said, they said we think you ought to come to this conference, and, and maybe you could even present something for us because we don't have many traditional makers. We're mostly contemporary makers, and. And so I said, sure, that sounds good to me. Well, I was just blown away. This conference was fantastic. And I was rubbing shoulders with all the guys that I'd read about all my life, Sam Maloof and Gary Bennett and Wendell Castle and, and so on and so forth. All They were all there just palling around and uh, talking about what they did, and uh, it was just, my batteries were charged for a year. Alf later became the president of the Furniture Society, but the accolades didn't end there. The Society of American Period Furniture Makers awarded him the prestigious Cartouche Award in 2008. You could have blown me over with a feather. I was just amazed, just, just absolutely, it was it was kind of out of the blue. I, I um, never expected to to you know to receive that kind of an award. Um, it, it was it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. But I did I have to say I did in my in my acceptance speech. I took a little while to talk to them about contemporary furniture. <laughs> I, I said, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a bully pulpit here, and I want to talk to you for a, for a few minutes about about an opportunity that you're missing. And I and I showed them several slides of contemporary work, each one getting a little wilder until I finally showed them. They they listened rather politely until I showed them Craig Nutt's flaming asparagus bench. <laughs> at which point, at which point there were great great hoots and cat calls. <laughs> Today, Alf is working on a new project. The whole uh, theme of this table is uh, banana leaves. The proportions of the legs are exaggerated, and, and, and especially when you, when you add the tiger maple drawer front with that big uh, banana leaf pull, those, that's not traditional either. And so, so those those features will give it a little, you know, a little, a little toehold in in contemporary design. I just I wanted this table to have a, a molding around the edge of the top as well, and so I just decided to pick that idea up again. But there were no, there were no um, uh, traditional precedents for that. So so I just I just came up with this this design that would be relatively fast and easy to, to carve, but in the end look very, very decorative and uh, 
flowing. Alf shares his technique while carving this decorative edge for the table. Well, it's, it's beautiful. How do you lay out your work? Uh, did you make a, uh, a template for it, or did you just uh, maybe use dividers and divide out the I space? Just, I just used dividers and divided out the space, and then the first thing I did was just draw in these arcs, and then I followed them with a V-tool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can see that, that I really don't even have any, any locations for these cuts. I'm just, I'm just spacing them by eye. What I'm doing with this hand, mm -hmm. obviously I'm providing a little support by, by holding it on the work, but this hand is pushing back, and this hand is pushing forward. And so all, all I'm doing then is, is lessening the, the grip on this hand a little bit, and that lets this hand overcome, and so it moves forward. But as soon as I sense I'm in a problem, I just clamp down with this hand and it's like a disc brake. It's bang, you stop. And then I come in behind the cut just, just a little bit and aim for the bottom. And it makes that little, that sweet little crescent oh, that's wonderful. shape there. See, and it, it is wonderful and, and really not hard. Alf's vast knowledge of furniture design and his ability to connect with students make him a natural teacher. Teaching is part of his purpose. I'd be known as someone who, who promoted the craft, uh, who promoted an, an appreciation for the craft, who promoted teaching the craft to other people, especially young people, so that, so that it never has the, it, it, it's never in danger of being lost again. There are many great woodworking societies and associations across this country. They provide a sense of community and great education. The Modern Woodworkers Association is one of them. Let's find out more. The Modern Woodworkers Association is an online and in-person group that works to bring woodworkers together to share the craft we love. Our mission is to educate woodworkers of all levels and all types, from beginner to pro, hardcore hand tool user to power tool fanatic, teach them how to share their knowledge, spread their knowledge base, find the answers to their questions, and help build the craft of the future, both online and off. We forge and reinforce online connections and create real-life personal ones with local gatherings in many regions across the country and around the world. Online, we host a bi-weekly live podcast every other Wednesday at 9, which can be seen at modernwoodworkersassociation.com or subscribe to in iTunes. We connect and ask advice and offer answers. We share methods, tools, and ideas, talk shop, and keep up with the latest woodworking news. We share information about what's going on in the woodworking community on our blog and our newsletter. We have discussions in the Modern Woodworkers Association sub-forum of Wood Talk Online and in the Modern Woodworkers Association community on Google+. Offline, we turn these online connections into real friends through hosting events and by getting together at shows, exhibits, and conventions. We have casual meetups where we eat and talk shop, we have group classes, seminars, and educational events, and we have group trips to lumber and tool yards. We hope you'll join us, online or off, to share the love of woodworking. If you'd like an opportunity for your woodworking community to appear on the show, then drop us an email at the address you see on the screen. We can't wait to hear from you. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Thank you so much for watching the show. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.